Okay, fine. Okay, just a little bit change. And uh, please welcome Mahdi Bolsani, am I right? Bolasi. Bolasi, okay, sorry for your pronunciation. Uh, and please uh, give us your speech to Drazi Queen's tradition. Hello everyone. Um, the, my name is Mehdi Borasi, and today's presentation, presentation it will be about uh, some at work achieved at University of Poitiers uh, with collaboration with ICPF and Charles University Institute, in Environmental uh, Institute. The topic will be about tetracycline degradation using catalysts of platinum supported over cerium oxide and mixed cerium zirconium. Uh, um, supports. Why tetracycline? Tetracycline um, is overused as antibiotics. Uh, it has been reported in different wastewater treatment plants effluents, and it is toxic for aquatic life. Moreover, the different um, uh, studies and research papers reported the presence of tetracyclines in lakes, rivers, also in um, Wastewater treatment plants effluent, which is evacuated in nature and environments. To prevent these um, um, active molecules to affect our environments, we, we suggest catalytic wet air oxidation. This process will degrade these uh, active molecules to either biodegradable uh, pollutants or um, the best is CO2 or really like total mineralization. We, we tested this uh, degradation in a batch reactor uh, under atmospheric pressure with 160 milliliter of uh, nearly saturated tetracycline solution with 640 milligram of catalyst or material. And um, the results <laughs> will be presented as tetracycline converted uh, Delta TET, which uh, refers to tetracycline uh, conversion percentage, and Delta TOC for total organic carbon abatement percentage. First, we, let's talk about the material, what, what I have used. I have used cerium, uh, pure cerium 100%, and a mixed oxide, cerium and cerium zir zircon, uh, around 50-50%. And the catalyst, uh, the, the prepared catalysts uh, were used using um, um, uh, ion exchange. We have coated 1% platinum over cerium oxide and 1% and 2% over cerium and zirconium mixed oxide support. Concerning the isotherm of the both supports, uh, the both supports showed mesoporous structure. First, the cerium zircon showed ink bottle shaped pores, and the, the pore weight uh, were between five till 11 nanometers wide. For the cerium supports and the um, derivative uh, catalysts, we can see that it's different uh, pore shape, it's slit or wedge shaped pores with the opening with three till four nanometers. Um, also, we can notice here that platinum coating has no effects on specific surface uh, changing. However, using catalyst in our tests, we can see some specific surface drops. And um, moreover, about the oxygen storage capacity of the material, we can see here that uh, the, using zirconium doping and platinum coating can boost the oxygen storage capacity of the material. First test, we have tested the two catalysts with different platinum loading 
but with similar uh, with similar supports, cerium, uh, cerium and zirconium supports at 50 degrees atmospheric pressure, and of course on tetracycline. We we can see that we have got um, almost 98 percent of tetracycline degradation, and um, this and the the, the the two percent have shown a little bit lower. This can be explained only by uh, chemisorption, hydrogen chemisorption. Maybe it can be due to the dispersion of the platinum. And uh, let's check it. For this um, uh, analysis, hydrogen chemisorption, first we started with TPR analysis. We have made a, a reduction of the material and the, the 2% platinum over serum zircon showed two peaks at a platinum oxide reduction. The first peak can be related to the exposed platinum oxides, and the second near one can be related to the um, overloaded, uh, over uh, covered uh, platinum oxides. And the uh, chemisorption proved this hypothesis by, by saying that we have 100% dispersion at one, in 100% 1 material, but to only 50% of the, um, at 2% uh, um, platinum loading. Uh, more, moreover, uh, with this analysis, we can calculate the particle size of our uh, platinum um, particles. In 1% platinum over serum zircon, we can see 0 0.96 nanometer uh, wide uh, particles and 1.92 uh, nanometers uh, pl uh, platinum uh, particles. Now let's move to test other um, materials uh, at 50 degrees atmospheric pressure. The platinum, uh, the about tetracycline delta tet, it showed almost no difference between catalyst and support after three hour tests. However, delta talk. It highlights the benefits of support platinum over uh, support boosting by efficiency of around 17%. Moreover, we can say here that at uh, the platinum over cerium zircon, it, it has better conversion than platinum over cerium. This can be related to the oxygen storage capacity. Another thing to mention is the blank, the, the catalyst list with air oxidation. It's with air oxidation. We can see that there was some tetracycline degradation, but most, most of it was converted to the byproducts. There was no mineralization or something. It was totally byproducts, just cleavage of the molecules. Maybe they could be more, more toxic than tetracycline. Now we, we would like to test a uh, different temperature. We have got the best uh, catalyst in the previous test. We have tested at 25 degrees and compare it to 50 degrees uh, to the 50 degrees. In this histogram, we can see the carbon distribution of our tetracycline where it goes. Uh, we have zoomed between 80 percent and 100 percent to, to, to see the small portions of byproducts and tetracycline. We have got 86 percent of mineralization of tetracycline for both, almost both um, uh, tests. But in the 50 degrees, we have a little bit more carbon adsorb adsorbed carbon, but less byproducts and less tetracycline left in comparing to 25 degrees. Now we test other materials at 25 degrees atmospheric pressure. The, we can see that a clear platinum effects observed boosting delta talk of cerium and cerium zircon support by 50% and 20%. And platinum-based catalysts still present a high delta tet and delta talk at a reaction time, uh, at reaction temperature 25 degrees. This is uh, interesting. Now we have got our best uh, test, 50 degrees, Platinum over cerium zircon atmospheric pressure. Now we would like to see the toxicity of the solution. 
Is it bad to read it in the, in the environment or good? We tried to perform HPLC MS analysis. We have detected many molecules. The most intense molecules were reported here. We can see most of the, uh, all of them are um, parts of uh, tetracycline uh, molecules, which has been um, degraded or partially de degraded. And um, assessing like this uh, uh, toxicity of solution is a little bit hard, especially considering that we have neglected some trace uh, pollutants, which, which can be important for toxicity. The, the best way to do it is maybe to try um, in vitro tests. In vitro tests, we have uh, made on the same um, um, treated water under platinum over cerium zircon at 50 degrees atmospheric pressure. We, first, we have tested tetracycline biodegradability. We have got tetracycline, we have put uh, a portion of um, wastewater treatment in a column to see what if it will be degraded. However, the tetracycline showed no biodegradability. There was no um, oxygen, uh, biological oxygen demand. Because here the blank, the blank contained only wastewater, uh, only ultra pure water. So there was no degradation of tetracycline. Now we would like to see if uh, to treat the water can affect biodegradability of other compounds. We have made a solution of um, uh, glucose and glutamic acid, which is easy, easily degraded by um, inner columns of uh, wastewater inner columns. And we have added 50 milliliter of uh, our solution of non-treated tetracycline and treated tetracycline under this test. Of course, the blank to keep the reference. We can see that treated solution has no in, uh, inhibition. However, the tetracycline solution showed some inhibition to the pollutants. And the last test, it was on um, uh, luminescence inhibition on Vibrio fishery, uh, um, Vibrio fishery microorganism, which is active. Uh, the main activity of this microorganism is uh, luminescence. We have measured, measured its luminescence under the, each sample during our degradation. We can see at one, one hour tests, we can see some inhibition of this uh, activity, uh, microorganism activity, but it's dropped down after three hours. In the con to conclude, we can uh, highlight that the 50 degrees atmospheric pressure, um, platinum over cerium showed the best degradation, reaching 98%, maybe related to the high oxygen storage capacity. Also, the, the, the platinum over cerium zircon showed higher mineralization over 85%. It can be linked to the bulk oxygen provision of the material. And toxicity assessment revealed that treated solution is innocuous and eligible to the environment. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please please ask. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Very nice presentation. And please, audience, do you have somebody some questions? Okay. I have a question related to particle size, platinum particle size. You presented quite tiny uh, nanoparticle size. Did you check, did you try to use any other methods such as high resolution DEM to confirm such quite tiny no. size? No, we haven't tested DEM. Because according to my opinion, it's quite low particle size, especially for the catalyst corresponding to 28% of the platinum. I will consider to check it. Thank you. Okay, please. Yeah. This is an accompanying question to Carlos. Uh, how precisely you determine the size? This is 1.92 nanometers. What is the uncertainty in determination of this? Actually, this, um, uh, thank you for the question. Actually, this, um, calculate, uh, this is based on chemisorption. Of the of the hydrogen on the material, 
And this is based, uh, I will show you the equation. Mm -hmm. This is the equation. It's a little bit much more theoretical and it's really based on the dispersion of the material. Yeah. We'll so could you, based on this equation, could you estimate the uncertainty of your size determination? I think the main incertitude, incertitude will be from the dispersion, but I don't know exactly the incertitude of the device we have used. But we, I will consider it to check it. Okay. The next question. Let's go ahead. We have tested two loadings of platinum loadings, one and two percent. It is better for performance for one percent. But you put some additional <coughs> measurement to obtain the optimal loading. It's you think it will be less than one percent, more than one percent? Thank you. Thank you for the question. It will be worth to test also 0 0.5 and 0 0.7. But we haven't done this uh, in the study. We just would like to keep it short and to have a full story of uh, our analysis. But it will be a nice idea to test other uh, percentage platinum building or even go other materials like um, uh, transition metals. <coughs> Could you test some of the catalysts more than in the reactor you showed in the study of the reactor? Or it will the reactor? Yes. You're looking to the moon. Yeah. So all the tests were done. Yes. It suspended uh, particles of. Yes, it was powder. Okay. And all the all the uh, catalysts at the same, the powder was all the same uh, physically, uh, the size of particles of the catalyst. You have the same size distribution mm -hmm. for the catalyst uh, for the different types of catalysts you used. Actually, I didn't have done the granometry analysis, but it shows it's, I, uh, it, it was really like powder, thin, thin powder. Like it was commercial, uh, commercial uh, cerium oxide and uh, cerium, mixed oxide. Cerium it's uh, porous uh, It's mesoporous. Uh, okay. okay. Okay, fine. Thank you. No questions in the audience, and thank you for your presentation. The next speaker will be Mr. Nirmal Parma. I hope you know, we will success Should work is. the presentation. <laughs> I hope to. Yes, uh, uh, I'll, I'll share your presentation and okay. then you okay. will uh, uh, you will say next every time you, uh, okay. you to change the okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay so, I get it. Um, okay. Uh, I hope it's shared. Uh, yes, I can see it. So, yeah, you can see it. Great, great. Yeah, so yeah. I'll just put it full screen and there you go. Okay. 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 Floor is yours. Fine. Yeah. Thank you so much for this chance to present my uh, work online, and uh, and I'm sorry for inconvenience. So uh, my study is on the stability of the ion nanofluids and the change in its uh, heat capacity over the long period of the time. So next please. Yeah. Okay, so the outline of uh, this talk is about the definition of this word ion nanofluids and its preparation and it's followed by the factors affecting this, this portion stability. And I will talk about these factors in detail further, and then I summarize the output. Uh, the next, please. Okay, so let's uh, let's break down this word. Uh, the strange word is ion and of course, it's a combination of three elements. The first blue is come from the base fluid that is ionic liquids. The second term is the nano that comes from the nanoparticles and the base thing is the fluids. So it's all together, it's our nanofluids. And in this presentation, it's some 
and donation, I will use the short form INF. So a little background here that the concept of the nanofluor was found in 1990, 1995 by Stephen Coe and co-workers. And the goal of this nanofluid concept actually to enhance the properties or tune the property of the base fluid for application. And now in the 2010, uh, the Neo Castro and their co workers they used the combination of ionic liquid as a base fluid and the nanoparticles. And they put together and tried to use it for different applications such as thermal energy storages heat transfer applications or heat transfer fluid. So this was the little background for the concept. Uh, the next, please. Uh, okay, so the regarding the preparation, so Anano, as I already said, this Anano fluor is a combination of the base fluor ionic liquid and nanoparticle, but it also requires the third element that is a specific condition for the mixing. And as a result, we have not just a liquid mixture, but uh, it's a gelatinous, gel phase kind of material as a result. And that was found first time by Fukushima and Takanori in 2007. They actually made this uh, sample for electronic devices. But afterward, as I said, in 2010, uh, Liliante de Castro, and the co-workers found that these samples can be used for other energy and thermal storage applications too. So in this present work, I consider the multi-wall carbon nanotubes as the nanoparticles and, uh, and a series of ionic liquids that is based on imidazolium ion. So two, four, six, up to 12, six, six different ionic liquids. And I the, the, the prime goals of this work to prepare this table samples to find to, uh, some matter to prepare the table samples. The second prime goal is to change in heme capacity over a long period of time. So with the aging of the sample, what happens inside the sample? That was the second goal and doing the data analysis. Uh, next, please. No. Okay, so here is the example for the preparation. So here is an example of uh, citumimim, the base ionic fluid and the carbon nanotubes. This is the preparation by two-step method that was uh, uh, proposed by the founder of this the material in 2007. I followed the same method and it's a, in a two-step method, the first uh, step was to, was to dispersing nanoparticles in the ionic liquids. These are the first two top figures. And in the second step, it's uh, mixing. So it's a uh, bottom left figure is after the mixing a certain condition. So it's a temperature, pressure, and, and some rotation for two hours. And as a result, after ultrasound bath, it's converts to a gelatinous or gel-like material. And this is the final product that is going to call as R nanofluors. So uh, moving further, next please. Uh, okay, moving further, to prepare for this samples, uh, I'm going to talk about the four different, uh, there are four different factors that affect uh, majorly on the stability of dispersion in ionic liquid. So first is concentration, second is aging. Uh, uh, next slide, please. It looks uh, next. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, and the second factor is the aging. So they have uh, aging of the uh, ion and fluids. And I'm going to talk about these two factors uh, only in this presentation because of the time limit. So there are, uh, uh, in the aging, I will follow the three steps. There's first, I will measure the, I will going to me uh, measure the thermophysical property. And the example here is going to be heat capacity. First, I will measure heat capacity of base, pure ionic liquids, a series. And then the heat capacity of the uh, new freshly made ion fluids and the, the heat capacity of the ion fluids after the aging for several months. So this is the whole goal. And 
uh, I will break it down in further slides. So next slide, please. Okay, so as I said, the first factor is the concentration. So here in the left side figure is the four different samples with the four different concentration with the base ionic liquid acetamine, the one example. And what I found that the concentration has effect on the stability. It has some threshold value. After that, these samples become stable. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here as I the I prepared the different samples as shown in the in the table. And what I found that at the one percentage is a threshold value at, at after this percentage or at close to this percentage uh, after sonication, uh, but uh, ionofluoride sample become more stable and stays in the gel-like form. But for the ultrasonic blast timing increase with the size of the cation, so with the increase in the carbon number, the cation in other words. So, uh, moving further, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, this is the another table that shows the time of stability I observed for the uh, nanofluids. Thanks to COVID, I was able to uh, do, do this uh, yeah. observation that these are the stable sample with one percentage and it stayed stable up to the months as showed in the last column. So the second column says shows the, the date I measured the heat capacity for the fresh one. And the third column say, shows the heat capacity I measured for the after the aging. Uh, the next slide, please. And the circle shows that the month stays stable. So it was more than two years, uh, more than one and a half years for minimum for each sample. Uh, the next. Uh, slide please. Uh, so moving further, as uh, I briefed before, the this is the example of uh, first nanofluor with the base on liquid cytomine with and its measurement. So x axis is with the temperature and the y is the heat capacity. Uh, the red dots shows the measured data from our lab and the other dots. For example, squares, yellow squares, blue squares shows the literature data. It fits perfectly, and means that the results are uh, measurements are going in the right direction. Uh, and, next, uh, and the next slide, please. Okay, so this is the freshly made on a clear sample. Uh, the red. Uh, pink dot shows the heat capacity measurement of the newly made. Uh, Ion fluids and its comparison with the triangles that is the pure ionic liquids. Unfortunately, for this combination, it's a decrease of two percentage. The next slide, please. Uh, okay, so it's decrease of two percentage of heat capacity, uh, and the 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 uh, heat capacity measure data was a little bit uh, scattered. It's, it has a trend, but it found a little bit disturbed and scattered. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now this is the what we targeted for. This is the, the comparison of the heat capacity measurement of freshly measured heat capacity, uh, freshly made anion fluid sample comparison with the aging after the aging aged uh, anion fluid sample is after 29 months for this combination cytomeme and the carbon nanotube surprisingly what is found that these sample shows stable reading after this many of months and uh, it has the same trend uh, next slide please but with the one percentage of increase it might increase uh, so uh this same pattern was followed for different phi combination and we had the result like the next slide please we had the result of comparison here for all samples so left side comparison shows the heat change percentage change in heat capacity for freshly made uh, ion fluids and the right side is the graph shows the comparison in aged ion fluids uh, next slide, please. Okay, so
So on the top, the green arrow shows the, for the new Ananofruit samples, it, it was found that the, the biggest size Ananofruit shows the maximum enhancement, that was 1%, and rest of these combinations shows approximately 1 to 1, 2% decrease in heat capacity. And the blue line shows the order of those combination of Ananofluids. The Ananofluid with the C2 mean, the smallest ion shows the decrease in heat capacity of 2%, that, that is with the red arrow, and it has a scattered point compared to other readings. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, whereas the right side for aged Ananofluid samples, uh, after aging up to more than one and a half year, uh, uh, ionic liquid with the eight and six carbon shows enhancement, and the rest of the uh, sample shows the one percentage decrease than the pure ionic liquid. So the order is completely changed after one and a half year or more than one and a half or more than 19 months. Uh, but next slide, please. The good thing uh, was observed that the before for the fresh on a plumber samples, the variation in overall variation heat capacity was up to three percentage. But after the aging, uh, the variation decreased and it stays in the range of two percentage. So still, uh, can be said that the samples become more stable with the time. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, in a summary, I would like to conclude that the for the concentration factor, uh, I was able to found a threshold value at one percentage at 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 uh, this uh, concentration. This person becomes stable and it stays stable. Particularly for the imidazolium ion based ionic liquids and the whole series. And these uh, ultrasonic bus time require more with the increase in the size of cation or say in the number of carbons. And in the, for the second factors, let's say aging and timing for these uh, sample, what I found that the samples become more stable, particularly talking about the cytomium TF2 and ionic liquids that particular sample become more stable after the aging uh, and so others as well. And the overall change, all the over variation in heat capacity decreases with the time. So in other words, uh, for heat capacity, it can be said that the sample become more stable for thermophysical properties. So this is it from, uh, from my presentation. Uh, the, thank you so much for the attention and uh, I look for the question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation and please uh, yes, the question to Mr. Nomal. <clears throat> and nobody? <laughs> okay. Uh, just uh, my question, because you used the carbon multiple nanotube, what was the source yeah. of uh, your multiple carbon nanotube? You bought the, some commercial product or it's something what you had prepared in law. Uh, can you please repeat the question? I can get, I, I hear your voice is a bit uh, uh, blurry, so I don't understand. Fully. Okay, uh, just a question about the carbon, multiple carbon nanotube. What was the okay. source of your material? Oh, I, I, I received this from our uh, uh, collaborative lab and uh, it's uh, from Sigma Ulrich company. Okay, Sigma yeah. Ulrich. The, the, yeah. This is a commercial product, yeah? Oh, yes, yes. It has some specifications, yes. Mm -hmm. With fine. Yeah. Okay, next question. Okay, please. Go ahead. I have a question on the precision of the heat capacity measurements. If yes, one or two percent of changes can be considered like, like significant. Okay, so uh, in overall, these measurements are done with the less than half percentage uncertainty, and it uh, it, it uh, covered it uh, uh, process with the diagnostic analysis. So uh, I'm sure that these uh, changes are pretty, uh, it's quite accurate. 
uh, but the about it variation overall variation in the heat capacity this is very first time I, in best of my knowledge i didn't come across any other literature that says about these variation over the time in the thermophysical property of or, or heat capacity so i think uh, uh, the less variation is good so i don't have any specific figure for the literature to comment or compare but in my opinion the this uh, com, uh, this measurements are uh, quite precise so uh, the decrease in the, in the the variation is is a good result I hope it's, uh, it's, I, I give okay. you an answer. Fine, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Okay, yeah. thank you. No next question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have a presentation from Mr. Radek Lovka. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for giving the floor. And now I would like to tell you something about the results of our work, which is named Embed Organic RSO Origin at the Rural Background Site in the Czech Republic. Organic aerosols is uh, one of the main components of atmospheric aerosol. Uh, their presence in atmosphere affects air climate, ecosystems, and human health. Concentration of organic aerosols uh, is significantly affected by meteorological condition and source of these uh, pollutants. Uh, source of these uh, aerosols uh, are uh, characterized very poorly in the air of the Central Europe uh, because we because it, we would like to characterize them uh, at the National Atmospheric Observatory Košetice. This is rural background sign in Central Europe, in Bohemia, Moravia, Heimlands. And in this presentation, I would like to tell you something about the results uh, from uh, four measurement campaign, uh, which are present for season of year 2019. 2019. Uh, in our work, uh, we measured with two uh, measurement uh, measuring uh, instruments, online aerosol mass spectrometers, uh, seat of AMS, which measure organic aerosol mass spectrum, sulfate, nitrate, ammonium, and chloride uh, concentration, and online measurement of uh, light absorption on aerosols was measured by ethylometer, which measure effective black carbon concentration and their source effective black carbon from fossil fuels and biomass burning combustion. Uh, for source apportionment, we used source apportionment model, namely positive matrix factorization model. <laughs> to positive matrix factorization model, the uh, matrix input was a uh, matrix form from uh, aerosol spectrometer, uh, uh, it was organic aerosol matrix. And this model uh, related to this uh, organic aerosol concentration to source specific, specific chemical fingerprints and contribution over time. Uh, now let's talk about the results. Uh, in uh, individual season, we was characterized uh, for respectively five factors of organic aerosols. Three of these factors as primary organic aerosols, namely uh, traffic emission, HOA, and biomass and coal combustion, BBOA and CCOA. 
remaining two factors was secondary organic aerosols. It was low oxidized organic aerosol, LOOA, and more oxidized organic aerosols, MOOA. Uh, individual factors have specific dilakers, uh, which was uh, related uh, on the human activities and on the height of the boundary layer. Uh, on this slide, we can see the development of organic arso concentration in individual season. The highest concentration of organic arso was in summer period, but in summer was the lowest share of primary factors. The highest share of primary factors was in the winter period. Um, um, meteorological condition uh, of on the uh, concentration uh, of organic parcels uh, was evaluated using two parameters, uh, backward tra trajectories and cluster analysis. Uh, backward uh, trajectories was calculated for every hour, and uh, this trajectories was clustered for uh, every season to clusters. And uh, bundle layer height was calculated for every hour. And from bundle layer height and wind speed was calculated ventilation index. Uh, but, uh, trajectories in individual season was grouped into four respectively five clusters. Uh, four clusters was in winter and in summer, five clusters in spring and in autumn. In winter was dominate uh, continental uh, clusters and air masses from uh, Central Europe, respectively from uh, uh, East Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, in uh, spring, summer and autumn, was dominate uh, marine clusters and air masses from Western Europe. Uh, concentration of individual factors uh, was uh, influenced by the clusters and uh, air masses. The highest concentration was in individual season for clusters from uh, Central Europe or uh, from Eastern Europe and for uh, air masses from the continent. Uh, on this slide, we can see the dilakers of ventilation index in individual season. The highest uh, ventilation index was in uh, summer period, the lowest in winter period. Uh, with ventilation index uh, was correlate uh, individual factors. The highest uh, correlation was for winter period. And uh, it was because the bundle layer has, uh, was uh, lower and uh, the concentration was influenced by a low dispersion situation. Uh, and in summary, uh, the highest concentration of organic aerosols were recorded in the summer period, uh, mainly due to meteorological situation for winter, spring, and autumn. Five sources of organic aerosols were identified for summer, four sources of organic aerosols, the large shares of primary factors, 29%, was found in winter, uh, the lowest 20% in summer. In winter was uh, the station uh, influenced by local and regional trans uh, sources, and in summer by long range transport. And significant <laughs> dependence of the uh, concentration of individual fact uh, factors on the origin of the air masses and on the height of the bundle layer height was proved. 
uh, this work is supported by this project. And it's all, and I thank you for your attention, and I'm ready for your questions. Okay, thank uh, you for a nice presentation about the organic aerosols in the air. And please send in uh, some questions. Okay, go ahead. How you can filter the backward trajectories? Uh, I uh, calculate these uh, trajectories in high split model. You know, two high split model uh, go uh, data from the satellite measurement and from measurement in stations as Koshidit says, and from measurement in uh, ocean. And... Okay, some next one questions. Okay, please. Is there any of your findings you can find like uh, unexpected or surprising? Sorry? If there is some your finding, which you, you find like uh, unexpected or surprising? Something very interesting. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, maybe with my fitness question, because you had a very nice map with the streams. Okay. Uh, have you analyzed, for example, the content concentration of the organic aerosols in each streams, or how is the mass flow of the stream? In the winter summer, because in the map there was not just only to their direction, um, but there is no total volume stream. Do you have such type of the numbers? Yeah, we done uh, any new method, mm -hmm. PSCF. Uh, yesterday was presented uh, from uh, Linecan, and um, it was uh, cal uh, calculated. Um, uh, Based on delta pressures or something. Yeah, yeah we do this. Um, okay, I think you have to stress it completely. <laughs> okay, thank you for your presentation again. Yeah. Okay, in this section, there is a last one speaker. And this is the Mrs. Dwinka Michalkova and paramagnetic resonance network analysis of plus plus one. Honorable members of committee, dear colleagues, uh, I would like to present you a part of my PhD thesis. Motivation for my work is the possibility to utilize an uh, approach of NMR metabolomics to study the influence only of the disease, uh, in this case of pancreatic cancer, at the molecular level by analyzing blood plasma. Since pathological changes in blood plasma can be observed before any local symptoms uh, are occurred, occur, it may help to overcome the main issue, late diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. It is due to uh, unspecific symptoms like uh, weakness, back pain, and others. Pancreatic cancer is well known for the high mortality rate. Only 5% of patients survive five years from the diagnosis. Another possibility to improve the prognosis is a screening program for risk individuals. Diabetes mellitus is included among risk factors of pancreatic cancer. The increased risk is uh, in subgroup of uh, recent onset uh, diabetes mellitus patients a specific type called uh, T3C diabetes, also known as pancreatogenic diabetes. Our main goal of the project was uh, to propose a screening program for identification of risk individuals for pancreatic cancer development among recent onset diabetes mellitus patients. Our study cohort included four groups, 
pancreatic cancer patients of all stages, healthy controls, patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus lasting more than five years, and recent onset diabetes mellitus patient having less than three years from the diagnosis. This is the risk group for us. In total, 207 samples were collected for the analysis. With focus only on low molecular metabolites in blood plasma, I like what's where ultra centrifuge, then mix with prepared phosphate buffer in D2O, containing chemical shift standard. Simple proton NMR spectra were acquired, then processed in specialized uh, metabolomics software, Canomex, by metabolic thing uh, profiling, resulting in quantification of 58 metabolites, and also by spectral binning. It means that the whole spectra were processed in small intervals. Both types of input data were normalized and evaluated by several univariate and multivariate methods to highlight the group differences. Firstly, results related to pancreatic cancer diagnosis in terms of discrimination of the group uh, among others. As can be seen on this slide, samples from the pancreatic cancer group represented by uh, red squares were successfully discriminated from healthy controls presented in uh, green points and also from the long-term long -term type 2 diabetes mellitus patients presented by blue points. Both of the discrimination models uh, reach accuracy almost 90%, which is very satisfying same as the values of sensitivity and specificity of these tests. The other question is, how do the group differ? The preliminary results of the concentrations level suggested some differences. For example, pancreatic cancer patients uh, exhibit higher concentration of mannose compared to balanced levels uh, in healthy controls and type 2 diabetes mellitus patients. The opposite effect can be observed for concentrations of valine, where the concentration in pancreatic cancer uh, is decreased. However, uh, the significant changes need to be determined according to some statistical tests. In this context, we use Wilcoxon non-parametric test. The results are in a full change projection. Statistically significant changes are highlighted in orange at two values. The left side of the graphs correspond to metabolites that were increased in group of pancreatic cancer patients. And the right side corresponds to the metabolites that were increased in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients and healthy controls. Clearly, more pronounced changes were in the discrimination of pancreatic cancer patients and healthy controls. 17 metabolites uh, fulfilled the statistical significance when were uh, discriminated from the diabetes mellitus patients. But for the clinical practice, we would like to have a specific panel of biomarkers to uh, diagnose pancreatic cancer patients. So we proposed a specific panel of eight metabolites, including 3-hydroxybutyrate, uh, mannose, glutamate, alanine, creatine, valine, proline, and lysine. According to the overlap of the statistically significant metabolites that you see from the previous slide. To evaluate this panel, we constructed receiver operating curves. And as can be seen, the values of area under the curve uh, exceeding uh, value 0 0.9, the maximum is one. And if we compare these values uh, for, uh, to the whole profile of 58 metabolites, in both ca cases, there was increase of the area under the curve. But what does it mean, these changes? We need to uh, have the bigger look. So we uh, provided a metabolic pathway analysis. The graph contains 43 nodes. Each node represents a single metabolic pathway, color and uh, size coding the pathway impact and statistically significant. Several changes uh, were statistically significant as, and some of them are highlighted in the table below. In general, our results correspond to uh, knowledge of uh, tumor cells proliferation. 
uh, it means that uh, there are enhanced demand for synthesis of metabolites to uh, support the rapid proliferation and migration of the cancer cell. A specific role of uh, glutamate concentration uh, was observed for pancreatic cancer cells. The main goal was to identify the risk individuals. We uh, proposed the prediction models for that identification. The initial step is discrimination of pancreatic cancer patients and long-term type 2 diabetes mellitus patients. Then uh, samples of the recent onset diabetes mellitus uh, patients were classified. Uh, represented by hollow circles, color coding the classification red in case of classification to pancreatic cancer group and blue in case to the diabetics group. In this way, 100 prediction models were constructed. Only models that uh, fulfill the accuracy above 85% uh, were uh, used for the identification of risk individuals and only the individuals were classified to the group of pancreatic cancer in more than 80% were the risk one for us. Then uh, uh, we re-examined the health condition of all the recent onset diabetes mellitus patients, and we found some uh, correlation with our results. In total, we had 59 uh, recent onset diabetes mellitus patients. We identified six uh, risk individuals. In four of them, uh, imaging methods uh, confirm pathological changes uh, on pancreas, highlighted with the green uh, arrows. In one case, it was directly pancreatic cancer. Other two patients didn't exhibit any pathological changes on pancreas by uh, computed tomography. However, one of them uh, was observed for increased risk uh, due to family history of pancreatic cancer. All of the patients are still under the medical observation. The uh, last part of this project that I'm currently working on uh, is uh, use of the NMR metabolomics approach uh, for uh, pancreatic cancer stage discrimination to support uh, the suitability for only treatment that it's a uh, uh, chirurgical resection of the pancreas. The preliminary results confirm that uh, this approach can be used for the discrimination of uh, all the stages from healthy controls and from the long-term type 2 diabetes mellitus patients with high values of accuracy. Moreover, some of the observed uh, metabolic changes very uh, specific only for late stages. It's uh, in the case of alanine concentration, and some of them uh, didn't uh, weren't influenced uh, by the stage. The direct comparison of uh, the stages, unfortunately, didn't provide uh, uh, accuracy high enough for the clinical practice. Didn't uh, reach eighty percent. So for the future, we would like to join some clinical markers to improve the possibility to assess the suitability for the uh, treatment. So to summarize, uh, pancreatic cancer was uh, successfully discriminated from healthy controls and type 2 diabetes mellitus patients according to the metabolic uh, profile of blood plasma. A panel of uh, specific biomarkers was proposed. Moreover, uh, six uh, risk uh, patients among uh, recent onset diabetes mellitus uh, patients were uh, identified. And there were some signs of uh, specific changes related to stage discrimination. So in conclusion, NMR metabolomics uh, proved to be a useful alternative tool for pancreatic cancer diagnosis. In the end, I would like to uh, thank my supervisors, colleagues, especially from the Military University Hospital and First Faculty of Medicine of Charles University, grant agencies for funding for the whole project of the PhD study and to you for your kind attention. Okay, thank you for a very nice presentation. Thank you.
just now we have started the discussion, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd be interested in a, uh, in a practical question. So now you're, you, you've proposed a panel of, of some biomarkers that can be used for, uh, uh, for diagnosis. How does that work? Afterwards, uh, what, what, what do you have to do for this to be in practice? Yeah. yeah, so I have like a thousand of samples. Unfortunately, we are working only with uh, hundreds of uh, it's really time consuming because the preparation of the sample takes uh, two hours. The measurement on uh, this spectrometer is also taking two hours. With new spectrometer, it can be only 10 minutes. So then we can measure more of the samples per day. And uh, in this way, we can. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, I was interested in something else. Uh, yeah, we, so you have yeah, and so when you have to work with the hospital, will, uh, how does that work in terms of legislation and um, you know? Yeah. Uh, we have uh, cooperation directly with the hospital, so we already have the ethical committee to prove these experiments, mm -hmm. and uh, from them we directly get the blood plasma for the analysis, if it's like yeah. that, okay. <laughs> but okay. it will take time. <laughs> we have a question. Uh, you showed these results of discrimination analysis. Yes. So you have some markers which you measure and based on this you discriminate. Uh, isn't it possible that, I assume that when you have a patient with uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, he or she will undergo some treatment. Isn't the state of these markers can it be influenced by this treatment? Yeah, of course. Uh, but it's also involved in uh, this study uh, that we have the treatment uh, procedures and everything, and we can then like eliminate eliminate it okay. some of the patients if it's not fitting for okay, us. Okay, so we are accounting for this. Yeah, of course. Okay, maybe my question because you it has been touched before. Uh, and it's about preparation of the sample. How complicated is the preparation of the sample? Because the, the blood plasma is a very complicated mixture. Do you separate the, some, some, some things with the So we already get the blood plasma mm -hmm. from the hospital. The only thing that I'm doing is uh, defrosting the sample and just uh, pipette the aliquots to the filter mm -hmm. and put in the centrifuge. And then okay. that's all then just edit uh, a phosphate buffer to stabilize the pH mm -hmm. to ensure the um, enough volume for the measurement. And uh, it, the buffer contains um, chemical shift standard for the NMR analysis. Okay. Okay, thanks. Questions? Thank okay. you very much for your valuable work. A nice presentation. I'm wondering why you said the accuracy to 80%. The accuracy, why you said it for 80%? 80%. Uh, it's common that for the clinical practice, need to exceed 80%. Okay, fine. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Okay, and now go on, Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.